Okay, my friends, it's good to see you all. Good to have you all here. Welcome. And for those of you whom I have not seen since either the Easter Vigil or Easter Sunday in which you were either baptized, confirmed, received First Holy Communion, received into the Church, whatever manifestation of that for some of you happened in the last couple weeks, a word of deep congratulations and joy to all of you. It was a joy. I mean, the fact that we had 18 to be baptized at the Easter Vigil and that we had another 12. Uh, I'm sorry the Archbishop didn't get to receive some of you into the full communion of the Church. He was planning to, and I found out, I think on Holy Thursday in the evening after the Mass of the Lord's Supper, he said, oh, I've got a retreat on Sunday, and I have to get to, to Florida, and I was looking for my flight times. I have to leave at like 6 a.m. on Easter Sunday morning. So all of a sudden, I became uh, his uh, delegate for uh, that great work. So for me, it's always a joy. I did tell him at uh, on Holy Thursday, we had dinner that night, I, and I went around and I asked all of the priests in the room, I said, what's your favorite uh, and most challenging part of the priestly ministry you have, either being the Archbishop of Denver or each of us? And uh, when it came around to me and somebody put it to me, I said, one of the most challenging things is, I said, Archbishop, you steal all my favorite things. You get to do all of the big things here at the cathedral that as a normal parish priest I got to do before, on a smaller scale. And so I guess in that moment, I couldn't really complain when he said, well, you take Easter Sunday at 10.30 a.m. And I have to admit, um, for those of you who were with us 10.30 a.m. on Easter Sunday in that packed cathedral, none of us, no one in living history has seen an Easter that full in that cathedral. We've seen some midnight masses of Christmas and some other Christmas masses that full, but no one at Easter has seen standing room only and all the way back into the narthex behind the glass doors. So when I got up there and I turned around and looked down, I'm like, Mamma mia, this is, uh, this is intense. Well, so here we are in these days of Easter joy, of celebration. For some of you, it's been, um, you've received sacraments and fully a part of the church. Other of you are along the line, road, along the road for the journey of just deepening in faith. Some of you might be preparing for confirmation yet to come on Pentecost Sunday. In the season of the church that comes right after Christmas in the long, excuse me, Easter, in the long go of the church's history, after all the sacraments were celebrated, the church entered into a period called mystagogia. And that's a fancy word, based on saying unpacking the mysteries. And this was the time of the year in which the church traditionally explained what happened in all of the sacraments. Now, we've been doing that some in these days anyways, uh, but we're going to keep doing that. I think it's always good to go deeper. Now, in the earliest days of the church, we're talking, oh, the 200s, 300s, 400s, often they would have people go through the year-long period of a catechumen, of a process of learning about faith. You would learn about the Trinity, but they would save the sacraments until after you already received them in part. It was like, here was a great, powerful grace poured out in your life, but we're not going to fully explain it to you, all the in intricacies of it, till afterward. And we'll unpack what happened to you. So, um, we didn't completely do that, and the church doesn't just like, you know, dupe you into sacraments, but I do think there's something to relish, to enter into and experience, because honestly, we're all still uh, living out of that. Even I, as a priest who have been ordained, both um, Father John James and I have been ordained 12 years. Uh, we were not ordained together, but we were ordained the same year in different places. So 12 years as priests. And I would say that there's moments that we probably have like this unpacking, like, oh my goodness, I never realized this great thing about being a priest. So I have to still kind of unpack it to live out of it. I'm, I imagine that happens in marriage every now and then. Like, wow, I was surprised. I didn't know that this good thing would be a part of this married life. So to baptism, so to confirmation, so to all the rest. So tonight we're going to kind of continue that work. We're going to, uh, tonight, talk about the sacrament of holy orders and understanding the sacrament of sacred ministry in the life of the church. So that'll be our principal conversation as we were talking about different sacraments. We've done baptism, confirmation. Last week was the sacrament of healing. That should have been what was on tap. And tonight we're going to talk about the sacrament of holy orders. Obviously, priests, bishops, deacons, that's where Father John James and I live. And then understanding it in relationship to uh, the service that we provide to give you all of the other sacraments, the building up of the body of Christ, the life of the church. So we'll talk about that. Let's right now, though, start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, almighty and eternal God, holy and blessed Trinity, we adore you profoundly, we worship you, Lord God. We thank you that from all eternity, 
you exist with perfect love for yourself, the three persons of the Trinity, and for all the creation that you have made. And for this creation that you have made that is good, that has fallen from you, you've redeemed us by Christ's presence, his humanity, the incarnation, past from the street, the reconciliation that comes, grace out Lord, we thank you for creating, establishing the church, the mystical bride of Christ, endowing her with your own self and your gifts, and letting us be numbered among the church, receiving these graces being transformed by the Holy Spirit. We thank you in the Easter days, the Easter days for the wonder, the power, the glory of the resurrection, and our own share in this event of the resurrection. We ask that the Holy Spirit be poured out upon us all, all the more deeply the people as we take up this conversation, so that we would not only ascertain some bits of truth and fact, but move in deep ways of knowledge and of wisdom. We ask that Mary, Immaculate, pray for us, and Joseph pray for us, all the angels and saints pray for us. We we'll make all of our prayers to Christ the risen Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we want to make sure they have the opportunity. So for sharing, last week, should have been Father Mike. I'm trusting it was Father Mike in here. No, Father John James. Was it always you? Or... Oh, yeah, you did a little switcheroo. Okay, yeah. Well, I always, I mean, I didn't watch the, the, the film. I didn't go back and watch the tape. So I, I imagine it was just a straightforward presentation on the sacrament of healing. So out of that, we'll... Uh, We'll do uh, the questions. Oh, I hope it works. If it doesn't, well, then talk among yourselves and just talk about something good. Uh, but the sacraments of healing, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, and the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, uh, traditionally called also last rites. So that's what we'll talk about. These beautiful sacraments, as they can enter into our lives, as they can let Jesus do his work of healing, writing order to our lives. So as you go around, your tables are turned to one another, however you want to do that. Um, but you know, do talk to some other people, don't just talk to yourself. Uh, introduce yourself, as need be, to those around you, because I think it's always good to have human connections, to have names, faces. Um, people need prayers, so every now and then just, if you've got a prayer intention, make sure that people around you know what that is, so that they can be praying for you as well. So we do that. What has impressed you with how Jesus works through the sacramental life of the church so far? So some of you, this might be fresh experiences, wow, I didn't know about this, or maybe it's just more intellectual, or, you know, so maybe it's in experiential, maybe it's intellectual. What of Jesus' humility in using the sacrament. We just have to think about how humble our God is to let his power be used through very weak instruments like Father John James, me, priests, deacons, bishops, that human beings can receive these sacraments, that God works through the power of water outpoured and baptism, through the simplicity of listening to sins and giving absolution and confession, through the bread and the wine that become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. This is very humble of Jesus. Like the majesty of God, so close, so accessible to be so near to us. And so we hold, we see the humility of Jesus, but also the power of Jesus working in these very seemingly simple ways. So what's impressed you about Jesus' work through the sacramental life of the church? How would you personally articulate a human need for healing? Physical? Spiritual, emotional, relational, psychological, there's a lot of different ways you can get need healing in your lives. So how would you articulate a need that we all have for healing? And how have you perceived this need and this desire for healing in your own spiritual journey so far? I've known people on a spiritual journey who are, pro who are thrust into it because of a physical need or a healing. Maybe, you know, they've got cancer and all of a sudden the reality of God has become real, need, real near in their life and they need the Lord in that. Maybe it's, oh, my relationship, my, I, I'm, I'm a mess on the relationship front, and I need meaningful relationship, or maybe it's mm, awareness of some sin, I don't know. But how have you perceived the need for healing on your own spiritual journey? Are there any, or have there been, or would there be, any fears or anxieties that you might have around the sacrament of penance, confession? I think I just want to put that question out there, because it's normal if there are. Like, we're all human beings. I'm a human being just as much as you are. Priests are not exempt from going to confession. We all have to also go to confession. I went to confession about half an hour ago to a priest friend of mine. So I don't even have like the option anymore, really, of the anonymity of the confession box. Um, none of us priests do. We kind of that's part of the, we lose that. I mean, like unless we're really traveling or something. So it really just comes down to us tapping each other on the shoulder or sending a text message and saying, "Can you hear my confession?" Which means that we're all friends and we all know. Um, and yet we have to meet each other with mercy. So 
maybe you have some fears and anxieties around with just how that sacrament works. Um, how about, how do you think the sacrament of the anointing of the sick might address the human fears around death and dying? Well, we obviously know that it, it gives grace, but it's really normal to have fears around death and dying. And so the fact that God has instituted through the church a sacrament to meet us in that exact moment, Something might be happening at not only the supernatural level of grace given to the soul, but just the fact that you've got a guarantee that if you call for a priest, someone's going to show up. One of us is going to show up. We need to in that last hour. So what might that, what, how God's ordering of things, what might be the good news of that? So I'll put these questions to you around healing and God's grace and all those things. We'll let you have a conversation for a little while. I'll go for it.
Okay, my friends, we'll come back together. Thank you. Okay. So tonight, as I said before, we're going to talk about the Sacrament of Holy Orders. So we've been going through each of the sacraments so far, baptism, confirmation, uh, is the Eucharist was that a week or two ago, and then we had the sacraments of healing last week, and then so now we're in the, the uh, social sacraments. We're in the sacraments that are communal, that serve the building up of the body of Christ. Tonight, Holy Orders, next week, that'll be on the topic of matrimony. And so, as we talk about holy orders, obviously, this is where we talk about bishops, priests, and deacons, those who are made part of the sacrament of holy orders to serve the rest of the body of the church. So it's the sacrament of order. So it's that which gives order and serves the ordering of the whole body of the church. There are three ranks of holy orders. We see them already witnessed to in the scriptures, and in the earliest writings of the church, we're talking about the Didache, the writing of St. Clement of Rome, we're talking about the writings of St. Uh, Irenaeus, uh, let's even go earlier than that, let's talk about um, Ant Ignatius of Antioch. If you read Ignatius of Antioch, you'll find all three of them, in all of its great letters, the Magnesians, the Philadelphians, the, the three levels of the holy orders are already there. The Episcopate, or the Episcopacy, that's bishop, so Episcopos is bishop, Presbyteros, the collective of all priests is the presbyterate. So you could speak here in Denver of priests, uh, but when you talk about the whole collection of all the priests of a place, like of Denver, we're the presbyterate of Denver. And then you have the diaconate, that's the collection of deacons. So you have the episcopate, presbyterate, diaconate, or bishop, priests, and deacons, respectively. Why order? Well, it's a group. Ordinans is your uh, Latin word, and it's very derived in the sense that there is a group that is there to serve a particular purpose. So the incorporation into that group that serves the purpose is ordination. So that's why we retain the word. So when a priest is made a priest, a bishop a bishop, a deacon a deacon, that mass and that conferral of that sacrament is an ordination. It's interesting to note that as much as that's tied into a Catholic sense of the sacramentality of holy orders, Orthodox as well, even some of our Protestant brothers and sisters when they speak of making their clergy, still use the Catholic word for it. They'll use the word ordination, even though they don't necessarily believe that a sacrament exists or a state exists into which somebody can actually be received as such. But there's such a kind of ancient Christian sense of the making of its clergy, the word ordination just survives even if people have had a change of theology about what it does. But ordination is that place where you're incorporated into a group, and we would say that is in a sacramental capacity, that by God's grace, that grace is poured out, and the Holy Spirit is working to make you either a bishop, a priest, or a deacon. This is a picture I pulled up here on the screen to the right. That's Pope Francis, and he is ordaining a man. And it's funny, usually I have to look to see what he's wearing to see what grade of holy orders. He's actually a layman who's being made a deacon in that scene, because I can tell based on the vestments. He doesn't. He's wearing an owl, but he doesn't have a stole on yet. The deacon's stole would run from one shoulder down here. I tease our deacons sometimes. If you ever see our deacons up there, their, their vestments tell what grade of holy order. So if you've ever noticed upstairs, bishops, priests, and deacons wear something slightly different. And the deacon, their main vestment is a dalmatic because it has its roots in Dalmatia, part of Asia Minor, Greek-speaking parts of the world. So it's an ancient vestment from that part. And underneath is a stole, a cloth that runs from the left shoulder down to the side. And I joke with deacons who, I said, that's your beauty pageant that stole. Because, you know, it kind of reminds you of the, of the beauty pageants. But I really make fun of people, deacons, when it gets put on the other direction. I said, when you're wearing it like this, you're a deacon, but otherwise you're, you're the beauty pageant winner when it goes the wrong direction. And we had an ordination mass in February here of seminarians, who two of them who were made deacons, who will be priests a year from now, I think it was, yeah, it was two of them. And one of the traditions in the life of the church is when you're being vested for the first time, so the bishops ordained you, you are now a deacon. You ask a deacon that you look up to to help you put the vestments on for the first time. So they vest you in your clothes, in the, in the clothing. And I was watching from up in the sanctuary down, and one of, one of the, the deacons, 
a new deacon, very close to me, but I know them all usually. And I noticed that the, the deacon who is helping him isn't used to putting it on somebody else. You're so used to putting it on yourself. He was putting it on beauty pageant style. And I was just smiling up there, and the new deacon himself realized, no, it's going on wrong. And so all of a sudden you see this kind of gesture of readjusting all the clothes up there as he's putting the, the vestments on for the first time. So there's the Pope ordaining a man as a deacon. And I don't know the exact story in there. This is something I found off Google. Um, make sure we had a good picture of the laying on of hands and the Pope doing it. So there's a distinction that we Catholics will make between what we do at ordination and what others might be doing between a means of election and delegation and then the Catholic understanding of ordination, which is a consecration. So a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters after the Reformation will speak of ordination and that they're ordained. And what that usually means for them is that their local community has chosen them, elected them, and presented them as a pastor, a minister for their community. And there might be prayers over them, but there is usually not a belief that anything changes to transform the individual person, man or woman, such as the case may be, into a new sort of a being, if you will, in that role. And so it's more either the community's presented you or you presented yourself and somebody has now deputized you to do the work. We Catholics understand that somehow God has chosen you for this. You've had to have years of discernment. The church has had years of discernment. Did God choose you as best as we can tell? Have you had classes and formation and all the preparation? And then, because a bishop, a validly ordained bishop, prayed over you, laid hands upon you, that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has chosen you and set you aside, and he has consecrated you, set you aside for the purpose of the ministry, and that this is a work that is ultimately from above, not from below. There is still this element, the man has to have a sense of himself, he's called to be a priest, he has to present himself, I want to enter seminary, I have to apply. So there is a sense that I have to want this too, but then the church discerns, and that ultimately, as much as you want it or don't want it, it's a gift that comes from above, from God, through the church, through validly ordained bishops as successors of the apostles. And something in you changes that can never be undone. Even if, God forbid, I or Father John James were to leave the priesthood, the church believes that our souls have been consecrated and given a new character, such as we all have had happened to us before baptism. So when you baptize a baby, something in that child, that soul changes. A seal is given, imparted. We believe similarly at holy order something happens. And even if, God forbid, I should have like abandoned the priesthood, go tonight, you know, go out in the night and hit the town and say, I'm never going back, which I won't do, I'm still, as the church says, a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, after the image of Christ. And so I would carry that priestly identity with me my whole life, and even unto death. Um, you can't undo that. And yes, every now and then, because this world is not heaven yet, we do have men who abandon priesthood, or some who sin so gravely that the Pope has asked them, would you please step aside and resume living like a lay person? But as we even say that, we never say that you're not technically a priest anymore because we have a different sense that once this is given it can't be undone you can't un you can't scrub the soul and get rid of being a, a bishop priest or a deacon such as the three might be in the three grades of holy order. so let's talk about holy orders in salvation history but we have to see its prefigurements first from the time of the old testament because we very clearly see that god instituted sacred ministry in the old testament that you had all of the Jewish tribes, but one tribe was set aside as the priestly tribe. And in that tribe, you had those who were even lifted up to a higher expression of this priesthood reality. So the Old Testament, you see a unique, there are unique calls to sacred ministry, and the particular persons receive those calls. Sometimes they're miraculous, involve a, a, something in the, you know, a voice in the night kind of a thing. But in the time of Moses, we see that God from Mount Sinai had instructed to Moses that his brother Aaron be set aside as the first high priest. And the physical, biological descendants of Aaron would be continuation of this priestly order. And that we have the tribe of Levi, and that tribe of Levi would be the priestly class of the Hebrew nation, of the Jews. That the 11 other tribes, 
the brothers of Levi and all of their descendants would be given land when they would eventually come into the Holy Land. So the Holy Land of, of the Jews was divvied up 11 ways. But there are 12 sons, 12 tribes, and the tribe of Levi, the son Levi and his children, it, they would be the priestly class, and they would receive tithes from the rest of the Jewish community to serve in this priestly capacity, that their only inheritance was God, not the land. So the Levites had to live in a completely different way than the rest of the Jewish community and had to have a different way of life, a different manner of life, a different way of supporting themselves. They had no property. They were not to be farmers. They were not to be businessmen. The, this was the priestly um, tribe within Israel. So you already see by this, and there's rituals that install them into this priestly class. So we have, at the time of Moses and going forward, there has to be this washing of the feet that has to happen. There has to be a laying on of hands that has to happen. There has to be the vesture in sacred garments that has to happen, and there has to be the anointing, the pouring out upon the body and the garments with holy oil. All of that was a part of the Jewish process that God gave to Moses and continued for hundreds, thousands of years afterwards of how the Jewish priestly classes were made and individual men who were then born into those families then received and lived out of the priesthood themselves. So we see God's established a ministry. He's given rituals for how you enter into it and live out of it. And there's even distinctive clothing that the rest of the Jewish community doesn't wear as a sign of that priestly office. We who are Catholics would say that Jesus took all of that and all of that pointed to a reality perfected in him and it was lifted up and given us in the New Testament priesthood, which is the fulfillment of the type of the early indication that was given in the time of the Jewish people. But one thing that we as Catholics with other Christians will say that the real priesthood, the most important reality is that which Jesus has. That Jesus is the one true high priest. We see the language in the scriptures. He is the one mediator between God and man. He himself says, there is no way to the Father but through me. So if there is an impediment to the human race coming alive, being in God's grace, and there needs to be reconciliation, there needs to be redemption, the one who helps overcome the divide, the one who offers the sacrifice that makes whole, is going to be the priest. And Christ's priesthood is a priesthood that's established not by biological sin, but by the will of God. And we see in the letter to the Hebrews that even from the womb he's constituted high priest. That's because Jesus Christ, in his very person, is God made man. In his humanity, which is united to his divinity, his humanity is perfect, and he can provide, by his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, he can provide the unique, singular sacrifice that reconciles us back to the divine. And our hope is by being united to Jesus, our eternal high priest. If I'm made one, all of us who are made one by baptism are united to Jesus, we live out of his grace. He who is our great high priest reconciles us to the Father. So we as Catholics will absolutely affirm, and this is not controversial, most Protestants would be happy that I've thrown this up here. We wouldn't do otherwise. Jesus Christ is our eternal high priest. There is only one mediator between God and man, and he is the high priest who affects our salvation in his personal sacrifice, which is the offering of his will completely perfectly to the Father, which then is lived out and expressed in time to the point of death, death even on a cross. But we believe that Jesus wishes to draw others into his priestly life and dignity. And we as Catholics will propose a twofold way. With this, most of the well, Orthodox will agree with us with this as well. First is a baptismal priesthood. The Catholic Church formally teaches that all the baptized have a share in Jesus' priesthood in a certain sort of a way. There is a different and distinct share that goes to his ministerial priesthood, those who are in the sacrament of holy orders who serve in a certain capacity to build up the rest of the body of Christ. By the gift of baptism, we're already configured and formed in a certain way to Christ. He that had were the body of the church. And in him, we're all made priests, prophets, and kings. We have a dignity that we're a priestly people. And what that principally means is that you don't have to offer the mass. You're not the one performing the sacraments, pouring out baptismal water, hearing the confessions. That's, the, that's not what it means for the lay faithful to be a priestly people. 
It means you're the people in the midst of the world, in the person of Christ, united Christ, who are offering up the sacrifice of your life, interceding for other people, letting God's grace pour through you. He's the one mediator, but he loves to draw you into his work. So he needs your prayers for this community around you. And he needs, he needs your love expressed in your acts of love, that are united to his love. And he's working in and through your person, your baptismal life and dignity. And that's your share of your baptismal, your, your royal priesthood. And that's a noble thing. We should affirm the good of that thing. Every Christian should have a sense of, I'm united to Jesus. And Jesus wants in an ordinary way to express his priestly love and concern for the whole human race through me. Now, you don't have to let it go to your head. Don't, oh, I'm Jesus' answer to the world. Look at me. Oh, priest, we ministerial priests can't do that either. Jesus is still the one. But he wants to share and communicate and involve and incorporate us into his own ministry, his own life and his work. So there's a baptismal way of doing this. Then the ministerial way is we see that already in the New Testament, and certainly in the witness of Scripture in the early church era, there are certain offices that have been established in the sacrament of holy orders that are an exercise of Jesus' particular ministry to the building up of the body of church, the conferring of these attachments, the teaching of the community, the ordering of the goods of the church. So we would speak of the ministerial priest having a unique participation in Christ's one high priesthood that doesn't rival the baptismal priesthood, but serves to the baptismal priesthood. Archbishop Chaput, who was the previous Archbishop of Denver before the current one, we've had Archbishop Aquila for about 11 years now, but before that, the one who ordained me a deacon, you're going to see a picture of that in a minute, I remember him giving some conferences in the seminary. He said, brothers, soon to be fathers, you look funny if you don't exist for the body of Christ, the, the rest of the church. You just look like people who dress up and do weird things. Your whole life has to be lived in service to them. And so even when you dress up and look different and you take different titles like father, all of this, this reality of the priesthood that Christ has given you, invites you in, shares with you, isn't just for you. It's of service to the whole body of the church. So that's why we can say that the ministerial priesthood is ordered to the building up of the communion of the church. At its best, I hope that we who are ministerial priests are helping you by teaching, example, encouragement, offering of the sacraments to be more the baptized, baptismal priests, so to speak, that you are called to be in the midst of this world. That's in part what we're called to do, how to live the dignity of being priest, prophet, and king in the midst of this world in union with Jesus Christ and sharing his love dynamically with everyone around you. That doesn't mean you have to kind of assume kind of the, the stance of like a ministerial priest. It doesn't mean somehow like, well, in the workplace, I'm going to every now and then take a Bible in hand and I'm going to give an impromptu homily in the workplace. No, that's not what we're talking about. It's more like after work hours when you go out to the bar and all of a sudden you're talking about faith, you can speak out of freedom in your heart, but realize you have a place. Jesus wants to work in through in that moment and your conversation at the bar or over a latte, the sharing of your faith and maybe praying for, speaking into other people's lives might be your exercise of this. Or for those of you that were called to get married, raise a family, you've got a little cell of the domestic church right at home. You don't have to have prayer services, but it's good to praise a family, right? And so you have this little experience where you're building each other up as spouses and forming a family, and there's a living out of something that's beautiful here, that's noble, your baptismal priesthood, in that context. Which is why next week we'll talk about marriage as an expression of the baptismal priesthood of how you could live that out in that context. Now, not everybody's called necessarily to be married, nor is everyone called to be a priest. And there's so many different vocations in the life of the Catholic Church, which I think is quite beautiful when you think about it. We have marriage as an option. Our clergy, that's an option. We have religious men and women. Some men don't ever become priests. So in the Brothers of St. John, they've got brothers who are brothers who are not fathers. So Father John James is a brother who is also a father. That gets really confusing, I know. But he is a brother who has taken the vows of poverty, chastity, obedience in the brothers of St. John. And as a part of their community, said, you know, it would serve our community all the better if this particular brother was also a priest. So they got a bishop to ordain him and make him a, first, a deacon and then a priest. You always have to stack that. I always kind of compare holy orders like a Russian nesting doll. You got to build them on top of each other. First deacon, that's the foundation of all of them. Then priest, and then bishop um, would be kind of the stages of the one sacrament of holy orders, the, the three grades of holy orders. So you have some of their brothers who are just brothers. And we've got religious sisters 
who don't enter into ministerial priesthood, but perform a beautiful presence in the life of the church and offer ministry. Oh, our religious sisters are the great ones who've done the most work over the centuries teaching, during nurse care. There's so many different fields there. Um, in my time in seminary, I had the wonderful Religious Sisters of Mercy. And the Religious Sisters of Mercy is the best educated order of sisters in the entire life of the Catholic Church. Every single one of them gets a doctorate or otherwise terminal degree. So I had with me, um, they taught us in seminary, so we have a bunch of PhDs teaching us at that level, but they had sisters who were trial lawyers who worked as public defenders in Boston. They, I mean, so these are, and, and I love it. Imagine if I'm ever in trouble with the law, I want my lawyer to be a nun who's dressed like a nun sitting next to me in the courtroom. I mean, it'll be a little different. I'm a priest and nun. I mean, it still might look weird, but like, I don't know about you. If I'm in trouble, I want a nun there with me in the courtroom. She, she was a great lawyer. But um, some of them are medical doctors, so I've known nuns who are medical doctors. All of these different things. So in the life of the church, there's so many different ways to express that. We've got consecrated virgins. So this is more for women. So there's a discernment. Okay, I don't feel called to be married. I want to give a gift of myself, my love, my heart, my sexuality over to Jesus in the midst of the church. But I don't call to be a nun who's living with a group of other women in a community. I just feel called to be so dedicated to Jesus, but still in the midst of this world serving him. And that doesn't always mean that one has to always technically be a virgin. Pope Francis has made that very clear. As one as long as, even if there's been a history now, one's living in a chaste sort of a way. But there's discernment, there's formation. This archdiocese, we have, oh, I mean, we might have seven to ten consecrated virgins. Uh, they don't usually wear anything super distinct or more special than you. Some of them are often up in this cathedral. You would never know that they're at Mass with you. But they are women whose whole life are given to God, and they're nurses and accountants, and they're, you know, they're in all the normal professions, but just Catholics who are tucked into those places. In my life, I like to think how, how creative God can be in so many different forms of vocation. So, like, it's, it's not just a few sections. Either you're married or you're clergy, and that's it. No. Some people are going to discern, you know what, I'm, I'm married, I'm not called to be married. I'm clergy, I'm not called to be married. I'm called to be religious, not called to be religious. You really can work with the Holy Spirit and the church, and there can be so many beautiful different expressions of that in the life of the church. And everyone's got a home. We can form a home for everyone, in some sense, in the life of the church in these ways. So that gives you a sense of, of, of the baptismal dignity. So let's talk about a theological basis for holy order. Who the bishop, priest, deacon is or becomes through holy order. We often use these Latin words, but I want to make sure you know these Latin words especially of a priest and a bishop. The priest or bishop acts, stands, is in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. And we would go on to even expand that out in a larger Latin expression, in persona Christi, capitas. So the priest and the bishop, most sublimely, stands, represents, serves, in the person of Christ, capitas, the head and the shepherd of the church. Every Christian by virtue of baptism is made one with Christ. You are in, in him, we have our, in him we live and move and have our being. So in one sense, every Christian in the person of Christ. But we can speak of that most profoundly by the consecration that comes to priests and bishops because they stand, they act, they represent, they do the things Jesus does to make holy the human race. So strongly, we have to be careful and make sure we understand what it means, but we can describe the priest or a bishop as an alter priestum, another Christ. And I say that with great hesitancy because I know myself to be a sinner and I am not Jesus Christ. I am not your savior. Please do not come to me thinking that I could be. I will not be able to do that. And I might like Father John James a whole lot too, but I've played one too many board games with you. That man's not your savior either. So he's my good friend. He's my very good. I like Father very much. So we're not your savior. Jesus is. But we get to be in his person and continue to perpetuate his presence sacramentally in the life of the church to do the things that make human beings holy. And that's why the church has had an honor for the priesthood, for the bishop as well as speaking of them as altar priests, other Christ, as long as we understand it rightly so that we don't somehow wrongly put on a false um, pedestal our clergy to worship them in a way that only Jesus Christ can be worshipped. It's a very important distinction. And I would say sometimes um, priests have wrongly promoted themselves and the priesthood, and sometimes lay people have wrongly promoted priests as like, oh, Father must be so holy. Like, mm, I'm a work in progress just like you are. Um, now, I do want to be holy. And I know Father James wants to be holy. 
Father John James wants to avoid. I know Father Mike wants to avoid. And I know we want our lives to be transformed by grace. And I know that without being on some weird false pedestal, but we, we want to be a good example too. But keep looking to Jesus. He's more important than any of us. So the priest, those are some of the words we use. The priest makes himself, uh, gives himself to Jesus, and hopefully keeps giving himself to Jesus, so that Jesus can then make himself uniquely present through the person and ministry of his ordained ministry. So we have to have an understanding of this word participation. This comes to us from ultimately both, both Hebrew origins and an understanding of how God's ministry works through human beings. And then the very word participation comes to us through Greek philosophy of how you can join in, participate in the work of another. I'll give you a common sense um, term of it. We all speak in this country of the good of participating in our democracy, right? And I don't, I'm not going to get into too much politics, but like we've, we've built a constitution that we presume that we the people are the basis of the governance of our country and that we, by our popular vote, elect certain officials to practically run it for us, but that the individual still has a responsibility to participate in the running of this country by the exercise of it through democratic forum, different ones, voting among them. So we have the sense that, okay, the United States of America works, and it's ordered, and it runs, and you actually execute what it means to have the country and its constitution through my participation in it. So the church, that's kind of my secular example, to have a sense the priest it's ultimately Jesus' work, but because of ordination, he needs me to participate in his work. It's his work, but he's giving me a share, a portion in it, that is not just me doing it of my own power. I'm going I'm to make the church great again. No. It's Jesus' church. He's the one who has divine grace flowing, and he wants to channel it by different means. And there's particular ways through the life of his clergy, he wants his grace to reach out to you. I just say, Jesus, I'm going to get out of the way and do my best, and I'm going to do what you want me to do is through the church. And so sometimes it means sitting in that little confession box for hours on end and just doing what Jesus and the church have established for me to do there so grace can reach you. It's not about me. It's about him reaching you, but he wants to make use of human beings in the work. So he's sharing out, allowing a participation in his ministry, and I'm participating in his ministry. The deacons of the church do this principally to serve the church's service of, the, of teaching the word, the, the truths of faith, in the celebration of the liturgy and in charity. In the early days of the church, we often spoke of deacons having their, their service of word, altar, and charity. And it was distinct and different from what priests and bishops did. So deacons are the fundamental level. But there are certain things a deacon can do. A deacon cannot celebrate Mass like a priest can. He can't confess the Eucharist. He can't absolve sins. He can't do the anointing of the sick. But he can baptize children. And in a pinch, any Catholic, any Christian, well, any human being could baptize a child in an emergency. So if you ever have somebody who's dying and they want to be baptized and you can't get one of us, take good, clean water, pour it over the head, and say, Betty, or the name of the person, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And if you intend to do with the church, your baptism will be as valid as my baptism. And the church actually obliges the pastor to teach her lay people how to do emergency baptism, which I just did. So, Betty, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, water over the head. Now, that's an emergency. If you someday, if God calls you to be married, and then, God willing, have grandkids, and you've got stubborn kids who aren't having their grandkids baptized, that's not an emergency. You can't baptize your own grandkids in the kitchen sink. You gotta have the church do, do that. But if the grandkids like seriously like gonna die, baptize the grandkid in the hospital sink if you gotta do that. You know, that's that's the difference. So the deacons serve in these ways. What a word. That's a way of teaching, catechesis. So here at the cathedral. We have our deacons teach our baptismal prep class. So once a month, the parents and the godparents of those who are needing to be baptized, they meet down here after a Sunday Mass, and the deacon teaches the class about what is baptism, what's the graces of the sacrament, how do you live it out. A lot of parishes do that. We give certain ways that a deacon can be a teacher teaching the Word of God. Obviously, you see every now and then the deacons preach at the homily. So here at the cathedral, it's about once a month. I, I set the date and time for it. The deacons go through rotation, and they can preach as well. So they're not think, 
teacher in the life of the church. In the liturgy, they assist the priest or the bishop. They can't do everything in the Holy Mass and the other sacraments that a priest or a bishop can. They're kind of our assistant. That's why you see, a, see them sitting to our side. They prepare the altar. They hand us things out. They read the gospel because they're an authentic teacher of the word. But they can't be the principal one to offer the Eucharist. But they assist us. They can have prayers that they say along the way. So they're kind of, and it's more than just an altar server to do, but they're an assistant in the celebration of the Mass. But the real place that we see from the Acts of the Apostles going forward is the Apostles were so busy with teaching and the governance of the church, and there were complaints in the first centuries of the church, so says the Acts of the Apostles, that the work of charity was being neglected, and there was a fight growing within the Christian community. Of, well, we've got a group of widows over here, and our widows aren't being taken care of as those widows are over here. So the Apostles said we must choose worthy men, ordain them, deacons, and we will set them aside for the work of charity so that as we continue this work of of teaching, of sanctifying, governing the church of the apostles, of first bishops, of priests, that we've got those who are helping us the work of charity. So every deacon, in addition to a parish assignment, has a ministry assignment where he has to do a direct work of charity out in the community. So, good example here at the Cathedral Basilica is we have Deacon Kevin McCutcheon. He was just ordained a year ago, and he's um, the most recently ordained. I don't know if he's the youngest, technically. Uh, about 60-something, I would say, early 60s. If you've probably seen him around, you would have seen him. He was at all of the Easter Triduum liturgies. He, he's originally from Southern California, so every now and then the Southern California, like, ballet girl inflection comes out in him just a little bit. I, I just love it. And he, of course, is assigned here at the cathedral. He's on a rotation, helps out with Mass, preaches at times. But then every Wednesday, he spends part of every Wednesday with the Christ in the City mission. And he's out on the street visiting with the homeless because the archbishop wants a deacon, not just good lay people, but a deacon to have the expression of charity in the heart of the city. So when it comes to which of the clergy is on the front line of doing works of charity, it's deacons. We all have a, every priest should be doing charity in some form or another, but it's not our primary ministerial responsibility in the eyes of the church. The deacons exist for that. A priest is encouraged not to become selfish, like somehow I'm an office worker, uh, in the clergy or somehow. So we also want to have front lines. So for me, it's important every now and then to, you know, at least be doing something out, out, out of the alleyway for the, for the homeless, to interact with our folks who come get meals quite the day here, uh, food and clothing when it's cold outside, um, other forms of charity. There's a lot of forms of charity. Then priests and bishops. And in this, the catechism tells us the priests or bishops, they act in the power and the place of the person of Christ himself for the good of ministry to and service to the lay faithful of the church. And so this is where we can speak of the priest or the bishop, you know, higher capacity, acting in the person of Christ, head and shepherd of the church. And so that's where the priest and the bishop, they can con convect the Eucharist, they can absolve sins, and they can um, perform the anointing of the sick. And bishops, and bishops alone, can ordain deacons and priests. So that's going to be the primary difference in the life of the church, other than the fact that the bishop is the overseer and has jurisdiction over the whole church. Father John James and I cannot never, without being bishops, make other deacons or priests. We can have some pretty good oversight. And I, I have to admit, I, sometimes I feel that as a priest, just me personally, Father Sam at this cathedral, I might be one of the priests who gets closest to an expression of what the bishop has more than I've ever had before, that's because I'm a dean, I oversee 12 parishes in this part of town, I go out and visit them, the priests in this part of town have to check up with me, I have some accountability oversight, I oversee 12 parishes in this part of town, and I report back to the archbishop, that I oversee the process by which we assign all new priests, new assignments. So every year, there's a whole group of us priests, these deans get together and we speak to the archbishop and say, you know, we really need a priest over here, and we have a problem over here, and we need to sort, sort people around a bit, uh, this coming uh, weekend is the weekend where we announce all of those new assignment changes that will take effect. And that'll, oh, in this archdiocese, it takes effect the 1st of July every year. So any priest who's getting a move will get up this weekend and say, well, in the end of June, I'll be leaving you here. And if there's a new guy coming in, we'll say, and you'll get Father So-and-so, who's your, your new one coming in. So, but I have the responsibility of speaking into that. So I told you earlier that I... I went to confession about an hour ago, 
That's because I was with a brother priest friend of mine who was getting a new assignment. So he knows what it is. And because he knows my role in this archdiocese, he knows what I have. But he's not allowed to talk about it with anybody. So today was great for him because for the first time in months, he's actually been able to talk to another person about his fears, his worries, his anxieties, his hopes about his new assignment. Because he's not been able to talk to anybody because we try to keep them somewhat. Because we don't want gossip to go everywhere and people to get worried. So we're like, fathers, we're going to announce it all publicly this weekend in, in, in April. And at that point, you can talk. But he's been bottled up sitting on it, and he needed to talk today. So he talked about his assignment, and I said, and would you hear my confession while we're at it? So that's what we did. So priests and bishops. But there's also a sense, this is where the clergy, if you will, participate in acting the person of God. But I also want to point out this, this sense that the priest or bishop also acting in the good of, on behalf of the church. So we can speak of the priest, the clergy acting in the person of Christ, but also acting in the name of, in the person of the whole church, in persona ecclesia, in the person of the church, in the name and the person of the whole church. Somehow, and I think people instinctively get it, Catholic and non-Catholic, when you see me, you, you know I represent the Catholic church. Right? Like I'm a living billboard of it. I, I, I'm like not the sum total of it. I don't get to speak for the Pope, tell the Pope what to do. But like when I walk down the church, I have very nice things told to me and some very nasty things told to me because somehow I represent the church. And, I, and everyone knows I can speak in her name on things, to a limited capacity. It's, you know, it's fun in different cultures of the world. The, the more traditional Catholic cultures of the world have little signs of reverence they show priests. And I think they're beautiful, without putting priests on too much of a pedestal. I'll tell you one of my favorites in France, Father John James. It's very simple. Father, he studied in France, got ordained and priest in France. Where there's a love for priests in France, uh, you don't just call him father. He's not just père, père's father. It's mon père. You always refer to the priest as my father. You see that just that one word adds a touch of almost of the heart to it. So I was in France on a pilgrimage to visit great French Gothic churches. Since I run an American one, I need to go see the original one in France. And I was there in October. And I was in the, the, the town of the, the city of Chartres, which is a beautiful cathedral. And I was walking through these older Catholic men. Seeing I love it. Older men, much older than I. And we just dipped the hill. Bonjour, mon père. And for me, like, I, I know the, the goodness of that. It's very small, very small indeed. If you go to Bavaria in Germany, or if you go to Poland, there are special greetings you give in German or Polish to a priest or a nun that you don't give to anybody. Now, here's the problem. When I go, I don't speak Polish. I've been to Poland three times. I don't speak Polish. I got, like, two words. I got dziękuję, bogzapłacz. And I've got bogzapłacz because when a layperson greets a priest, they say something a little of uh, praise be Jesus Christ, a little greeting uh, in honor of the priest. And there's a saying that the priest should offer back to the layperson. And I don't always remember it. And I don't know if it's Bugzapwatch, but basically that means God praise you. God, God bless you and God praise you. So I'm like, Bugzapwatch. And that's good enough. So I got to hold on to that one saying when I'm with Polish people, I've got to have my one Polish expression. Otherwise, I don't want to offend them, you know. So there's these little signs of, of kindness. But of course, you know, the world we're in and there's enough priests who have done horrible things and have used the trust that was given them hurt people. So I've also I've also heard some real nasty things thrown at me. Every curse word you can imagine. Just for walking like this from people who don't know me. Oh, I've been called Satan himself standing outside that door out there. So people know that we represent the church. So we're in the personal church. We've got to use that responsibly. We're not, though, merely delegates of a community. Somehow, mystically, we, we can represent the whole of Christ and thus the whole of the church that is there. And so the whole church refers to the union of the head and the body. And so if the priest stands in the person of Christ, the head and shepherd of the church, I'm united to the body. And so there's this relationship that a priest is a part of the whole of Christ building up the body of Christ. So he's acting in the person of the church to do this work of building up the whole body of the church. The three grades. My image of the Russian nesting dolls. You first have to have the, 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 the most basic, the deacon, then priest, then bishop. But it's only the bishops who have the power given by God to make the rest. The bishop, the episcopacy. Here is our Archbishop of Denver. Of course, you organize him. And next to him to the right is Bishop Rodriguez. I put both of them up here because they're both bishops, equally bishops. But one has a jurisdiction over this, this archdiocese, and one does not. The archbishop is the bishop of Denver. 
He is the overseer of the Catholic Church, the presence of all the baptized in northern Colorado. But because we're such a large diocese, have so many Catholics, and I'm going to be very honest with you all, because the Archbishop struggles to speak Spanish fluently, he asked Pope Francis for a little help. Can you get me another brother bishop who can work alongside me, be my helper bishop? Auxiliary bishop just means helper bishop. So he is not the overseer with the authority of jurisdiction over this archdiocese, but he is, by ordination, a bishop of equal rank and dignity, as much a bishop as Archbishop Aquila. So at big liturgies, you'll see both of them around, but this is the archbishop's proper church. So that's why only the archbishop sits on the cathedra, the, the chair, the throne of chairs. Bishop Rodriguez doesn't even. Bishop Rodriguez has to sit on the same chair I, that we sit on. Shows you, like, in the life of the church, only the actual overseer, the real shepherd, only the bishop of the diocese sits on the throne, or the pope. The pope, he outranks everybody. Now, Bishop Rodriguez happens also to be a pastor of a parish. So we have St. Joseph's Parish at 6th and Galapago. If you're ever going down 6th at Galapago, which I, is a sign, of, a proof of our bad Spanish trans, uh, pronunciation. Like anybody who knows real Spanish knows that we have a lot of really bad pronunciations here in Colorado. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of Salida. That's just, uh, yeah, uh, Buena, uh, Buena, uh, Buena Vista. I mean, like, these are butchered Spanish. It's Salida, my friend. It means exit, uh, and not Salida. Um, but that's Colorado. I love this state. So at 6th and Galapago, um, we have St. Joseph's Church, and Bishop Rodriguez is the pastor of St. Joseph's Church. And then he goes out in his spare time, and he is, um, uh, serves in all the ways a bishop serves, principally to be the main one who gives confirmation um, in a lot of the Spanish-speaking parishes. Um, and we have a lot of those. If you've discovered, we're a very diverse archdiocese. By diverse, I mean completely. We got. I look out at this cathedral, and I see people from every continent. I talk to people from every continent. It's like the beauty of the Catholic Church and all of her universality out there. Even among those that we have recently baptized and confirmed, I mean, it's so beautiful. But all these different backgrounds, ages, races, ethnicities, all that. Uh, but in this archdiocese, we've been blessed by the presence of so many who've come to us from Central and South America, and Spanish is a major language, and so Bishop Rodriguez, um, who himself is from Mexico. We all we, we joke with him, he's from Merida, Mexico, and he grew up right next to Cancun. So we're like, mm-hmm, yeah, you were, you were like resort Mexico. Um, uh, but he came up here, he's lived here a long time, he's an American citizen now, um, but there's, our, there's the two bishops, the archbishop and the auxiliary bishop. Bishops, we, we believe, we affirm, have always believed and affirmed that the direct successors of the 12 apostles, and they continue the office and the mandate of the apostles in a communion together, in union with the Pope, who takes the place of Peter, the chief of the apostles. And we already see in the New Testament that Christ is calling the apostles to a duty, but he's often deferring to the unique role that Peter is going to have in organizing the apostles. So that when they ask, who do they say that I am? It's ultimately Peter who speaks up, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ says, you are Peter, you are Petrus. His name is real name, Simon. Petrus means rock. You are the rock upon which I will build my church and the gates of the netherworld shall not uh, withstand it, basically. And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which is why the papal coat of arms, which I decided to wear on our basilica coat of arms, because we're a papal church by being a basilica, the keys of Peter are on our coat of arms here. But that's what was entrusted to Peter and his successors. And that when Peter's um, own faith would fail, we know he betrayed our Lord. It doesn't mean that every bishop or every pope is going to be always holy. It's not how it works. The first one betrayed our Lord before the cock crowed twice in the midst of Jesus' suffering. Our Lord must know what he's doing. And he says, but when you turn back to me, you must pray to strengthen the brethren. So the Pope has this necessary role of leadership guidance, but unity, to build up the unity of the church. And that, part of that unity is to hold all the other bishops in communion with him. And so we have all of the bishops as successors of the apostles, but they're in a communion with each other and with the person of the Pope. 
the bishops, we would say, would contain the fullness of the holy orders. There's only one sacrament of holy orders, but it comes in three grades, three degrees. And that's why I give you that Russian nesting doll image. He's got the fullness. He's the fullness of the doll. Father John James and I are both deacons. We were both, both ordained deacons first. You have to be a deacon first. And then we went in and got ordained priests. So we are deacons and priests. We received two ordinations, but only one sacrament of holy orders. And how that exactly works, it's one of these things like, well, I have to tell you, it's a mystery and I can't fully explain it. The church has not yet found a way, but we don't believe there's three different sacraments. We believe there's one sacrament, but three different grades by which you live it out. Deacon, priest, bishops. They have the principal work of being teaching, governing, and sanctifying Christ's faithful. They are the head teachers, those who, who head in, or are the head in the work of governance and the head of the work of sanctifying, so much so that we would speak of the Archbishop of Denver as the principal one to maintain and teach the Catholic faith, what we believe in faith and morals in the Archdiocese of Denver, that's his job, and that we priests should be informed by him, and as he maintains his fidelity to the revealed word of God and the tradition of the church, that we, in collaboration with him, teach. So, now, what does that actually look like? Most of us have a sense of what the Catholic faith is and we're faithfully preaching it. Please God, please God and praise God that when it happens. But every now and then, he might say, okay, I really want to focus on some point. I ask all the priests at the same time to preach at every parish, in all the archdiocese, at the exact same time on certain points. So we've done that a couple times. Like I think the most recent was two Advents ago. The archbishop said, I really want people to understand what charity is. How you unpack the gift of charity, how you live out of the fruits of charity in a deeper theological way, not just a mamsy pamsy loosens of love, but actual Christian charity. What's the gift, the theological virtue of charity? And he says, I want you to spend five weeks, and he gave us preaching points for each of those five weeks. We could develop the homily after that if we wanted, but we had to hit those five points. He's the te main teacher, and he asked us to be in communion with him, and everybody was. A year before that, the Archbishop said, I want them, I want everybody to send the essential Christian message. We call that the charisma. It's like the bullet points of Christianity. That you're created, that you're fallen, that there's a redeemer, and that you are then called on to mission. And he said, I want you to spend Advent and each Sunday of Advent hit those four points. And all of us did. And it was so fun for me as a priest to know a lot of lay people all over the archdiocese. And he said, and they said, we went to multiple parishes. I'm like, you all preached on the exact same thing. How did that happen? He asked us to do it, and we did it. That's all it but like People were really shocked. Like, wow, I went to different parishes each week, and it was like one continual homily that just built on each other. It's like you all had like planned this. We did. And we were letting the archbishop be the main teacher, the main governance. Well, he's the one overseeing the care of all of the Catholic Church in Northern Colorado. He assigns where the priests are. He oversees some of the very practical things like how we spend money. Um, he has a lot of respect for us, but if he found that, now Father Sam, you know, there's a policy that we don't buy automobiles for you. How did you end up with a Bentley bought by the Cathedral Basilica? I don't have one, by the way. But you see, if they, like, they found, like, well, first of all, it's policy you can't, we don't buy you a car, and how did you get a car and a car that nice? We're going to be looking into your books. So that's just real practical oversight. Every now and then, people call in with praise about their priests, and sometimes every now and then they call in with complaints, and if there's a bad enough complaint, they'll have to do some sort of investigation on it. And that falls to him in the role of governance to make sure that we're doing that, especially the priests, the deacons, and then lay people who work in the church. He has to oversee that. He's got a lot of people who have to help him do this. Oh, and part of it is going to be the work of charity that we do. So, I mean, we believe, we really believe in charity in this archdiocese, the whole Catholic Church, to the homeless, to the immigrant, to the poor, the needy, the unborn, you name it, we do it to the tune of this next weekend, we're going to ask you to participate in the Archbishop's Catholic Appeal. If it's on your heart to do, do it. If you don't want to, don't do it. But I didn't tell you, it is worthwhile, and I give every month to it. We raise over $10 million a year to the Archbishop's Catholic Appeal, and he helps decide how we're going to divvy that out to serve this community. So, and most of the work that comes back, and this is where I feel like when I was in the suburbs, I was like, all that money goes downtown. Now that I'm downtown, I'm like, all the money comes downtown. Literally, it's like Samaritan House over here. The shelters that we run for the poor who would otherwise sleep on my back alley. It's some of the food and the clothing services that, that we give. 
I mean, there are so many concrete works of charity because that's guess, I mean, just how the demography and sociology works that the poorest of the poor filter into the hearts of cities usually. So we're trying to provide the needs where the people are actually at. But that said, we've got some help that goes up to Fort Collins, to Boulder. We try to spread the love out as best as we can. Try to send some to the good of Catholic schooling. Um, some helps go to our seminary to help form and educate future priests. So we have to pay lay people to, to be their professors and those things. So we have so many forms and works of charity, but I mean, we're blessed in this archdiocese. The people that are so generous, it's about $10 million a year. And as the overseer with the role of governance, he has to decide how we're going to divvy that all back out. Because everybody would love a piece of that pie. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're discerning. And he has to, he actually, he and his people, I've, I see them do this. They, they pray about it. You know, some of that money comes right back here. Because this cathedral, I love this cathedral. But if you kind of notice, we're not like a normal parish. Uh, we don't have like a, we're not like a suburban church with a lot of families and like their Yukon pulling up and ripping out big checks and like, and we're just, we're not that, we're an inner city cathedral. I love it. Praise God. I wouldn't have it any other way. I can't afford to run this cathedral off of the offertory. They come in here. It's just not possible. I have no staff to work for. It'd be Father John James and me doing everything. And I don't want to do that. I kind of like having that choir and to have a choir like we have, I have to have half of them paid. That's how you have to have a cathedral choir. Every cathedral in the country has at least part of the gate choir. So I got to pay for it. So part of the Archbishop's Catholic appeal comes back to the tune of $300,000 a year just for me to run the things that keep a cathedral open. So I get my little piece of the pie. I've never been a bigger supporter. I feel like so like it's like a pork barrel kind of a thing. I love that Catholic appeal because I get my slice of the pie in it. We all do here. We all benefit from it here at the cathedral. So the, the, the bishop also has the sanctifying role. He's the chief liturgist of the diocese. He's the one to make sure that the sacraments are being faithfully uh, celebrated. Um, every now and then there's innocent mistakes, and every now and then sometimes you have a priest who kind of got a wonky, crazy idea. And so as we've been talking about the sacraments, the importance of doing them rightly to confer God's grace, we don't play around with them. We had a, a priest years ago who said he had to step in like I did and do some confirmations, and he said, you know, I don't really like the, I don't like the language that the church uses to confirm. So when I confirmed Austin, Austin, what, 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 what name did you take for your confirmation thing? Peter. I confirmed you. Peter, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. As in those words, I put the sacred prism on his forehead a week ago or so. So I have to say the words. I have to have the permission of a bishop, the validly ordained Catholic priest. I have to have a sacred prism. I put it on the forehead as I say the name. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the sacrament of confirmation. I can't just say, you know, I don't like those words. Confirmation, it, it would be so much more meaningful and special if I got to make up the words. Then it's not sacrament of confirmation anymore. It's something else. It's a nice prayer service, but it's not confirmation. So we discovered a number of years ago, a priest was just making up his own words. And took the archbishop in all of these roles who said, Father, you're going to do all of them over again. And you're going to explain to your people why you did them wrongly. And you're going to redo them rightly so the people can receive absolutely the grace of the sacrament of confirmation. So thanks be to God, we don't really have this problem all too much. But I gave this as an example, not to like scandalize you, oh, bad priest. No, it, things happen. But the bishop has this role. And he wants to make sure that people are learning the fullness of truth or being shepherded in a way that builds up the body of Christ and sanctified to be made holy. So then that's, and I would suggest too, that the bishop must never forget he, in the person of Christ, is if Christ is wed to his body, the church, when we speak of the church as the bride of Christ, the bishop who most directly represents and participates in the priesthood of Christ must have, if you will, almost a nuptial spirituality of love for the church with total chastity. So when a bishop's ordained, when he goes to the altar of God and the hands have been laid and the oil's been poured, one of the things is a ring is put upon his finger in which he is told, take this ring as a sign of the pledge of your bride, the church. It's a wedding ring. Priests sometimes, occasionally will wear a ring, but it's more for devotion, the kind of mind thing that the archbishop has to wear a wedding ring through the Archdiocese of Denver. And in Southern and Central Europe, the ring finger for marriage is not on the left hand. That's Northern Europe and Western Europe. Central and Southern Europe is the right hand. So next time, look for the archbishop's right hand and says the ring finger, that's his wedding ring for the Archdiocese of Denver. Uh, most people don't even know that, but that's what happens. Now the priesthood. 
This is me offering my first Mass 12 years ago. So I was ordained. Priests are co-workers with the bishop. We share with them in their role of teaching, governing, and sanctifying. It's not mine to have all by myself. I'm not the authority. But I do the things that he has me do. I'm in union with him. But I can truly teach, I can truly govern, and truly sanctify in the life of the church. We speak of the priests and bishops also enjoying these sacra potestas, sacred powers, if you will, but because of that participation in the person of Christ, the things that Jesus does in and through us. He can offer mass. He can absolve sins and confession. He can anoint the sick. He can teach. He can pastor in the person of Christ. Now the diaconate. This is me, 13 years ago, ordained as a deacon upstairs by Bishop, Archbishop Chaput, who was, after here, went to Philadelphia and is now retired. I'm now feeling bad about putting this up because I look so much younger. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't put up baby pictures anymore. But the deacon, of course, shares in the, in the mission of Christ, this grace, in his own limited way. A character is imprinted, so it's still holy orders. Something's changing in the man, but it's not in the same way that a priest and a bishop is served. We see the history of the diaconate clearly in Scripture, the naming of the deacons, the serving of their deacons. We see them all over the early church. In the Middle Ages, up till the time of the Second Vatican Council in 1960, deacons were increasingly, from the High Middle Ages up until about 1970, only those men who were in seminary studying to be priests in the last step. So we've always had the diaconate, but by the Middle Ages to Vatican II, it was basically limited to the men preparing for priesthood, and it might be from a matter of two weeks, to six months, but no more. And it was a very transitional stage, not a permanent reality. So you didn't have people just generally going around who were deacons and not just deacons and only going to be deacons. Now, in the High Middle Ages, we did have a couple. St. Francis of Assisi was a deacon. He was ordained a deacon and was always a deacon and never became a priest. He didn't think he was worthy to be a priest, which sometimes makes me feel bad. I don't know about you, Father John James. It makes me feel just a little bad. Like that super holy saint we all know is super holy, is St. Francis of Assisi didn't think he was worthy of this. Like, oh, Lord, help me, because um, I'm no St. Francis of Assisi. But at the time of the Second Vatican Council, there was a thought emerging, wouldn't it be good, again, to have deacons who were only deacons who didn't get ordained priests and bishops, who could show the fullness of holy orders and continue that work of direct charity? Because if you have a man who's only a deacon for a week to six months, he's not going to be doing all that work of charity in the same way. So since the Second Vatican Council, We've had a push for a diaconate that's permanent, and you can always see it. That's why we have them here. Now, it hasn't caught on in all the world like the U.S. 90% of the world's deacons are in this country. Most of Latin America has not still bought into the diaconate. They think, oh, the people of God, they'll be so confused. What's a deacon? What's a priest? Let's not even go there. So there's very few in Latin America. 90% of the world's deacons are in this country. For whatever reason, well, we guess you've gotten used to it. You, you can, oh, you're a deacon, you're not a priest. No. Um, Pope St. John, I was speaking of like a week, Pope St. John Paul II, he was a, a, a deacon before a priest for only a week. So he was ordained a deacon one week, and then the next week he was made a priest. So sometimes it's been very short between those ordinations. So let's talk about, lastly, some scholastic distinctions. Scholastic, that there are some Thomas Aquinas, some precision around how you make a man ordained. Form matters. So form are the words that you say in the celebration of the sacrament. It be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The words you have to say. There's a prayer of ordination for each of the three grades that the bishop has to say. It's actually pretty long and lengthy, but he has to say those words to ordain the man in that point. The matter is so what he physically has to do. So it's the taking of prism and putting it on the forehead is for confirmation. Baptism is the water poured over that baby. So here, it's the laying on of hands of the man's head. So you saw it in the picture of me, the laying on of hands in the scene of my diaconate ordination. Here is Archbishop Chaput when he ordained Bishop Conley. He, con he ordained and consecrated another bishop in this scene. Bishop Conley was our auxiliary bishop when I was in seminary. And when Archbishop Chaput left to go to Philadelphia, we were without an archbishop for a year. And before Aquila came, it was Bishop Conley who ordained me a priest. So that's my succession right there. Uh, uh, the one who ordained me a bit, uh, uh, ordained me a deacon, and the one who ordained me a priest. So they laid hands on. The minister, the one who performs the sacrament, must be a validly ordained bishop himself, a successor to the apostles. 
every Catholic bishop at his ordination as bishop gets a decree, a very fancy scroll with calligraphy on it that has the man who ordained him, 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 going back to the 1400s, and the rest is over in Rome and takes you back to the days of the church. Pretty impressive. I love going into bishops' offices and seeing like the whole, it's like the lineage, the family tree. It really is cool. And most of us don't even know who, who was who was Bishop Guido back in the 1300s. But, you know, there's Bishop Guido. The recipient must be a baptized man to receive the sacrament of holy orders. The grace that is conferred is the character of the order. So what's given, baptismal dignity, being confirmed, the grace of receiving communion with Jesus Christ through the Eucharist. This, you get the character to be a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. And the fruits that come out of it is your opportunity as the individual to grow in holiness by your participation in this ministry and then to serve others in the building up of it. And honestly, we priests all the time see the graces that come out of our ordination. It's in your lives. We see, oh, I did that one little thing. It wasn't me, it was God, but something beautiful came out in your life. Thank be to God. It wasn't me, it was what God did in and through, through me, almost in spite of me sometimes, and you're the fruit of it. Praise God for that. Oh, that's it. Next week, Father Mike, unless... Something changes, but I doubt it'll change. Father Mike will be back, and we'll talk about matrimony next week. Okay. That was a lot. Holy orders. Question. Yes. Oh, sure. Well, it's a good question. Oh, I, I like that. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So, um, in some diocese, they have a way that you can request of your bishop a change of assignments, or are sometimes put in for like, so let's say, so we all, in this country, the U.S., the, our bishops in this country have said, we're going to have terms and term limits for our priests. And we, we all live on six-year terms here. And they can be renewed. And so it's not like presidency, two terms, and you're in. Two terms is normative, but you could, you could be given a third term. But the bishop is the only one who can make the decision. He has to make the replacement. In this archdiocese, and most, we don't get a say at all. So I can't request where I'm going, even if I know my term's coming up. He makes the call. Now, hopefully I'm also living in so much a relationship with him, he knows something of my heart, my own desires. And like, and if he were to like, if the cathedral were a horrible thing for me, he should like know that. And like, why would I ever think of putting him at the cathedral? But oh no, Father Sam's got some gifts for the cathedral, so let's put him at the cathedral. Like, so hopefully you're in enough relationship and communion, you know, strength and weakness. But I don't get the vote in that. But we do have this mechanism where the deans, and I'm one of them, can speak into it. Because the thought is, can the archbishop know all 300 priests in the archdiocese of Denver? No. I've got 30 in my deanery. I struggle to know my 30 in this part of town. So I meet one-on-one -on -one every year with my priests that are, I help oversee, and I ask them, what's going on? What's your life like? What are your interests? What are your passions? Uh, and then I take that feedback back, and I speak into that. Um, some parts of the country, though, um, they might have, like, you know, St. Saint, um, Saint Betty's Parish is coming up, and um, fathers, we want you to know, here's some stuff, and any of you who might be interested, let us know if you're interested in going to St. Betty's. And some places do have that. If you can put your name in the hat, doesn't mean you're going to get it. So. Um, so that's for being a pastor to parish, you get assigned, and then usually at a term, six years ago, for being a bishop. Now, well, so how does that work? So that, the Pope alone gets to name bishops, and what they do is they realize, okay, we've got a need. So they ask the papal nuncio, the papal ambassador to a country who works for the Pope, he says, I need you to, to ask around the bishops who they think are good priests who would be good candidates to be bishops. Get us a collection of names. And so our papal nuncio, of course, is in Washington, D.C. He's always in the capital city of the country. Uh, he's a Frenchman, uh, and he, he represents the Pope in this country. And Every now and then they'll say, oh, we need some more bishops in America. I mean, we've got over 200 dioceses in this country, so we need bishops here. So they'll get a collection of priests, maybe a smorgasbord from all over the country. Maybe Denver, you know, maybe he'll reach out to Archbishop Aquila. Archbishop Aquila, do you have any, pri any, bish any priests right now who could be good candidates for future bishops? And he'll maybe put a little list together and give it to him. And then they'll come look at this list, and then they'll start a very top-secret process of soliciting information about the candidate. They'll ask different priests and lay people who know them under pontifical secrecy. Please tell us in honesty, and there's a list of about three, four pages of questions about this man. What are his strengths? 
Is he a man of holiness? Is he pursuing God? Are there any moral things that would be really bad way we should never make this one a bishop? Like, you'd be totally honest on the thing. You can never tell the uh, the person who is being asked, like the, the candidate, that he's being considered. Because there has to be so total freedom that you don't want anybody lobbying politically for anything. So all of this information comes back. So you might have 15 sets of testimony about each individual priest who comes back. And then that people noon who has to go through all of that. And then he calls it down to, he thinks, who are the best candidates for being bishops in the United States? And then he gives that to Rome. And there's an office in Rome called the Congregation for Bishops. And the Congregation of Bishops, they take all of that, and they take the list, the names, and like, okay, these are the top three. So, you know, we need a bishop in, you know, Saginaw, Michigan. And these are the top three candidates based on all of that process. It took a long time to do. Holy Fathers, these are our recommendations for your top three picks for the Bishop of Saginaw, Michigan. And the Pope looks at it, and he says, I don't like any of them. It's going to be Father Sam from Denver, or whatever, you know. Uh, he has all the freedom to do whatever he wants, but they try to help him out, because there's no way the Pope can know every priest in the world, let alone every bishop, because there's 5,000 of them, to know how those assignments work. So that's the raw process of how the church, that isn't of the gospel, per se. The church has just had to find a method for the Pope to name bishops. And that's, that's has evolved over the centuries, and that's how we do it. And it has foreseeable problems, but like that, the best that we could come up with uh, in the world we're in right now. Um, so that gives you a sense of, and that's something, honestly, most Catholics have no idea how bishops are made. Like I've just shared with you, like how the sausage is made. Um, and to let you know, they'll call uh, uh, the priest up. So they might call, you know, uh, Father Jim Bob over here, who maybe the Pope said, he's my bishop for Saginaw. I want him to be the next bishop of Saginaw. And Father Jim Bob, maybe this whole process has been going on for nine months. And Father Jim Bob had no idea. Now, all of a sudden, he's getting a call from that papal nuncio and said, Pope Francis wants you, Father Jim Bob, to be the next bishop of Saginaw. And he says, oh, well, praise God, yes, I'll do it. Or, absolutely not. Like, I can't do that. I can't be a bishop. And maybe in the worst case scenario, it's like, I've got a skeleton in my closet, and it would not be good for me to be a bishop, so please don't do that. So right now, in Catholic News Reports, just in the last two weeks, have put out that about 50% of the men who are being asked to be made bishops in the U.S. are telling the Pope no. They've never had such a high rate of no. I don't, I don't know fully what's going on, but I mean, it, I think it's just a hard time to be a leader of such... It's hard to be the leader of such a big thing as a diocese in the life of the Catholic Church in the climate that we find ourselves. So pray for your priests, pray for your bishops, and pray that God would send us good, holy, faithful, strong, courageous future bishops. Um, so everything I've shared with you is all public information. Like nothing, like Father Sam's not letting you on any secrets today, uh, but that is the how process of all that faith, all the bishops. Any other questions? Cardinals, great question. A cardinal is an advisor to the Pope who is either a priest or a bishop who is an advisor to the Pope and by being made a cardinal belongs to the clergy of Rome in addition to whatever role they serve. The vast majority of cardinals are all bishops. So they're bishops who serve in Rome who are overseeing all the Vatican offices or they're bishops of really, usually really important places throughout the world. So traditionally, the Archbishop of New York City is always made a cardinal. The Archbishop of Washington, D.C. is always made a cardinal. The Archbishop of Mexico City is always made a cardinal. Buenos Aires of Westminster, London is always, so all the big, Paris, France, all the big ones are usually also made cardinals. And in the Vatican ones, combined with the ones who are, are the archbishops of, of their local countries, they add up, and there's usually about 120 to 180 cardinals at any given time. And they become the advisors to the Pope, and when a Pope dies or resigns, the papal electors. They do not have to choose one of their own. But I don't think we've had some... We've, for the last 500 years, they've only chosen one of their own in the Rome. Hypothetically, whenever Pope Francis dies, and a conclave, the meeting of the cardinals, happens, they could say, all these cardinals from all the world could get together in that Sistine Chapel, be locked in, conclave, conclave with key, locked in for a couple weeks. We just can't find a good candidate. Phone call comes to Father John James. 
Father John James, we need you to fly to Rome immediately. The cardinals have elected you as the Pope. We will have to ordain you a bishop, and then a second you're ordained a bishop, and if you accept, you're then Pope. Will you get on the plane? No. Father just said no. Uh, <laughs> but they've done that before. So there's been times when they have said, we don't have the right candidate in this room, but we know who it should be. We need to contact, in the Middle Ages, with a letter. It might take weeks to get the man there. Uh, but get him here, and if he's not yet a bishop, we have to ordain him a bishop. It has to be the Bishop of Rome. And then he will also have to accept it and got the jurisdiction of being Pope over the whole world. So the cardinals are made by the Pope alone. He selects them. And there's not an ordination to make it a cardinal. It's just a distinction in the life of the church. So you are a priest or a bishop who serves in this role, and you're given the dignity of wearing the red that you wear, which is a sign of the apostles who all but John died by martyrdom, uh, by blood martyrdom. So the fact that cardinals wear red is a sign that they have to be like the apostles in service to the Pope and willing to pour out their life to serve the whole church. And that's why red becomes a real important color around cardinals and the Pope. It's actually, the Pope is dressed in white only for the last 500 years. So the Dominican order, so Father is a brother of St. John. They're, you see their habits gray. I've seen him in some different shades of gray, to be quite honest. He's got a whole, like, well, I can't say 50 shades of them. That would not be good for me, but he's got several shades of gray. And so he's got multiple shades of gray. But the Dominican order, they wear white with a black cloak on the top of it. So white's the color of Dominican. And in the 1500s, was it Pope St. Paul? Which one? Which who was, There was a Dominican who was made Pope. And guess what that Dominican who was made Pope did? He said, I'm not changing into pil those old-fashioned pil people colors. Pi Pius V. Pius V was a Dominican priest who was made a bishop who was made pope. And he said, I'm going to still dress like I've always dressed. I'm wearing my white. And ever since then, the popes have always worn white. But that's not the actual oldest color for pope. It usually was actually the same thing cardinals wear, that cardinal red. So, which is why, this is a really weird Father's Amateur Catholic trivia. If you ever see me in my fancy getup uh, where I've got my cassock on, then I've got my white surplus, and I've got a little shoulder cape called the Mosetta, it's black but with cardinal red lining around. That represents that I run a papal basilica. That papal color of red is the papal color, and even I get to wear just a touch of it, representing that I run this thing up there. So, so that's a cardinal. And a cardinal can be undone. So you can be stripped of it because it's not an ordination. It's not a new character imparted. It's not a holy order. It's a special distinction given by the Pope, and if he gives it, he can also take it away. Any other questions? If you have any more, I'm willing to take them, Father. I mean, Father John James, this is our life. We live this. This is We love this. But all of this serves to serve the rest of it, so we love all the other sacraments as well. But we're, like, we're going to be totally nerdy because this is our life. Uh, so if you have any questions about Holy Orders at any time, just ask us, or Father Mike, or ask the deacons about what it means to be a deacon. And if you can't ask the Archbishop, ask him. Not, I mean, you get to see him at this cathedral more than anybody else does, so... I mean, you get all the holy orders in one building. Most don't get that. Okay, what I'll do is we'll say a prayer, I'll give you a blessing, and we'll call it good for this evening. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, I ask your abundant blessing to come down upon everyone here, those who've joined us online as well. Build us up, strengthen us, help us live out our faith. We thank you for the gift of all the sacraments, the sacrament of holy orders. And we ask that we would cooperate, participate in every grace you give us in all of our lives and all of our vocations. And so through the intercession of our blessed mother Mary, St. Joseph, and all the holy saints, bishops, priests, and deacons of the age, may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Yeah.